If you crash landed on Earth 65 million years ago, hours before the extinction of the dinosaurs, what would you do? A routine exploratory mission to drop off a group of colonists on a distant planet becomes the work week from hell. When a pilot ship experiences catastrophic engine failure after hitting a rogue asteroid field, and he's forced to stop for repairs in the worst hole on this side of the galaxy. He's not too concerned about being rescued until another survivor needs him to dip back into pilot mode to get them home. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the dinosaurs in 65. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, the version of Kylo Ren that went to therapy is living with his wife Alia and daughter Naveen on a planet called Somaris. Despite technology advancing to the point of everyday intergalactic lactic travel, cancer is still a to get rid of. Naveen has been through countless treatments that have all failed, leaving Mills and Alia to figure out how to pay for the next one. Mills works as a pilot, which in this world means he's a glorified space semi-truck driver. This time, he's transporting colonists through unexplored space on their search for a new world. The journey will take two years, but it'll completely cover the cost of Naveen's next medical trial. What's a guy to do? For one thing, ask for a whole lot more happiness. Pay. Halfway through the journey, Mills is woken in the middle of a meteorite shower. Checking passenger vitals. Cryostasis normal. Don't worry, those pods are supposed to leak like that. Probably. The ship's Siri works about as well as ours, only telling Mills to take manual control after they've already passed the exit that would have let them go around the storm. Apparently, this asteroid field came out of nowhere. Let me get this straight. This advanced USCSS Covenant starship has no autopilot or object avoidance system, and no one bothered to hire a second co-pilot so they could take shifts and no one would have to sleep on the job. Great. Eventually, a meteorite slams into one of the ship's fins, and they're forced to make an emergency landing on the nearest available planet. And wouldn't you know it, they just happen to be flying over one as they crash. And not just any planet. Planet, one of the extremely rare ones that can actually support human life. Mills may be a starfaring captain, but he's clearly never been to sea. During the worst of the storm, he pivots the vessel towards the planet, increasing the surface area of the ship exposed to the incoming rocks. <laughs> Why let most of the rocks fly right past you when you can catch them instead? Remember, Mills, be the arrow, not the shield. Rocks tear through the cryo chamber section, obliterating most of the human life on board. What we're looking at is this company's very strict anti-lawsuit policy. As we all know, dead cargo can't sue. And this was a completely unavoidable tragedy. Literally nothing they could have done differently to avoid this. Mills wakes with shrapnel embedded in his abdomen. Apparently, first aid isn't part of the pilot training in this world. As he pulls it out immediately, he bloodlets for a while while crawling for the antiseptic spray before he gears up in a flight suit and assesses the damage to the ship. It's completely totaled. Wires everywhere, the hole broken apart, the bloody water spilling in through doors that won't close. Hope he sprung for the extra insurance on this rental because he is definitely not getting his deposit back. You know the Ridge, the people that created advanced wallet technology, they're at it again with rings. Whether it's to signal that you're a taken man, to augment your striking power, or purely as a status symbol to separate you from the droves of barbarous homo sapiens, this beveled ring made from tungsten ore and polished in a variety of striking colors is the answer. Wrapped around my finger is their Alpine Navy ring. And I must say, it looks good. Not feeling the Alpine Navy tungsten style? Don't worry, the rings come in a variety of premium materials like carbon fiber, 24 karat gold, and titanium. It's got a convex, no pinch fit, scratch resistant PVD coating, lifetime warranty, and a 99 day risk free trial. Each ring also comes with a dual band silicone version. The never lost and forever fit protection is clutch, so if you lose 20 pounds or lose your ring, Ridge provides two future exchanges for the same 
same ring. Brandish your marriage and social status to those around you by going to ridge.com slash nerdexplains and pick whichever color fits the self-concocted image you have of yourself. Plus, get 10% off if you use my code nerdexplains. We find out Team America won the space race as the ship's armory survived unscathed. At least the company was smart enough to stash energy weapons aboard. Mills summons a space rifle and gracefully exits the ship. Bro should know better than to be wading around in knee-high water on what can only be presumed is Dagobah. Bodies and debris litter this swamp around him, and he's definitely not alone. Now he's gonna get f***ed by a dragon snake. On the other hand, he probably is safe for the moment, walking around in the lizard equivalent of an all-you-can-eat buffet. Hopefully they're too stuffed to go after him, and who can blame them? We even brought barbecue. But I'm pretty sure standard protocol is to stay inside the relatively safe walls of the ship until you've had a chance to look out the windows for signs of danger. You've been here all of 10 seconds, and your ship is surrounded by bait. Maybe wait a second and see if anything hungry comes out of the woods. Back aboard the skeletal husk of his ship, Mills rewires the console like he's hot wiring a Honda Civic. Because spaceships are notoriously easy to fix. Just pull the dash cover off, turn it on and off again, and she'll start up no problem. The fact that she's torn in half will buff right out. If anyone receives this, I'm the only survivor of a long-range exploratory mission. The computer tells him their current location is unknown, but, like, you knew the path, right? Until the moment of impact, you knew the course we'd already traveled and where we were headed. I know space is stupid big, but somebody, some company, knows where we went down, right? Welcome to Subnautica, if it took place on land. I mean, welcome to Ark, Survival Evolved. Mills records a Hail Mary distress call, saying the ship is completely totaled and that the planet has a breathable atmosphere. The atmosphere is breathable. Um, just because you can breathe does not mean your immune system can handle all the swamp microbes you just inhaled with your panic gasping. He's overcome with memories of his daughter, who we learn that died halfway through the mission he went on to save her, then deletes the message and re-records it. He says he's the only survivor, and there's no reason to send a team to retrieve him. He fantasizes about ghosting himself while watching old holodeck recordings of Naveen, until he hears the beep of a still-functional cryo pod on the control panel. Mills wanders into the wetlands, stumbling across a nest of recently hatched somethings, and hears the angry growl from Mama before he finds the downed pod. The young girl inside is still alive, but had the foresight to wait to go into cardiac arrest until he got there. Unfortunately, his dad instincts seem to still be recovering, because he shoots the door off the pod like there isn't a soft, squishy blood bag inside. He starts his trek back towards home base with the girl, only pausing long enough to realize he crash landed in the wrong franchise. They make it back to the ship where Mills tries to coerce Siri into telling him where the escape pod aboard their ship crash landed. If they can find it and if they can survive the journey to reach it and if it's still intact and functional when they get there, then they can leave this oxygen rich planet to float around in a ship with reduced oxygen capacity until Zaphod Beeblebrox can pick them up. Mills surveys the area, treks into the direction the ship fell. It isn't long before he stumbles across a money shot and a geyser erupts, nearly scalding him with hot water. Man, if only there were types of equipment that could protect our heads and hands from these hazardous conditions. Suddenly, something shiny catches his eyes across the valley. A quick computer scan tells him it's the broken tail end of the ship and the escape shuttle. Crash landed on top of a mountain 15 kilometers away. A noise grabs his attention from below in the valley. Some creature that looks like a T-Rex is chasing what looks like a herd of Uteraptors, cousins of the Velociraptor. Suddenly, one of the rabid birds leaps at him from the cliffs side and tackles him into the ground. He wrestles it off and bashes it to death with his rifle. At least he's not wasting ammo. <laughs> Looks like meat's back on the menu. Mills continues on, but it isn't long before something moves in the brush nearby. He pulls back the leaves to find the other survivor watching it. She runs for who knows what reason until they spill over a berm and land in a feeding pit with a decaying carcass of a pterosaur. Time to run. Go! 
Thank you. They make him back to the ship where he treats a burn on her arm and looks her up in the manifest. She's a colonist named Koa. Unfortunately, she speaks a language he doesn't know and his translator is broken because of course. He pours out some red powder on a table and draws her a diagram of their journey to come up the mountain to the escape ship. An escape vessel. And that's where we... Looks more like how you crash your escape vessel into the ground. In return, Koa draws stick figures of her parents, who were obviously on the ship when it crashed. Mills lies to her. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to tell you. They're on top of the mountain. He is lying to an orphan, but I will say, it is motivational. And if that's what it takes to get her to the escape ship, then I guess it must be done. He sends out another distress call about Koa's survival, and walks in on her watching old Game Boy cartridges of Naveen. It lights a fire under his to escape this emotional evisceration as soon as possible. They start their hike across the valley immediately. Maybe we should hold on here a second and make a plan. I'm all for plunging into the wilderness, but we are on an unknown planet we know is teeming with predator species. We literally have not seen a single herbivore yet. The first step is to gear up in the armory where Mills pulled his gun. We'll later see he brought a few of these toys along with him, but at this point he should be operating like a dude playing an inventory management game for the first time in his life. Take everything. Anything that can be used as a shield or protection, and anything that can be used as a weapon, as long as it isn't heavy. Maybe they did, but I doubt it. We never see some of these baubles again, and Koa's carrying jack all as they trapeze across the landscape. I get the whole ounces equal pounds and pounds equal pain and all that. But you know what also equals pain? Getting torn apart by dinosaurs. The second step is to have a plan for only traveling during the day. This is simple logistics, but also a great way to avoid the mind killer, fear. Kids are scared of the dark. I'd be scared of the dark when there's a million dinosaurs hiding in it just waiting to tear my face off too. We don't have night vision equipment, so we'll have to use a light, which will be about as useful as the dangle on an anglerfish. We're gonna draw attention to ourselves in the pitch black like we want to die. Frankly, the easiest way to avoid a travel at night is to get to the other part of the ship before nightfall. That's right, I mean today. The distance to the ship is only 15 kilometers, or about 9.3 miles. Healthy and well paced with a kid in tow, we could cover that distance in four or five hours, barring complications. And by complications, I mean dinosaurs, obviously. Guns and ammo are a great start, but they should also be wearing their suits to eliminate human odors, in case any dinos hunt by smell, which they absolutely would. The other way to mask their scent would be to occasionally pick up plants and dirt and rub it into their exposed skin and suits. But there's one other tool they should be using to help easily navigate this world. We'll get back to that soon enough. Honestly, this this trek seems super chill. Too chill. Koa gets distracted immediately by pterosaurs and logs. And by the extinction level event casually happening overhead as they walk. Oh, right. This is supposed to be an action thriller. Mmm, soaking all that sweet, sweet meadow walking action. A few minutes later, Koa gets bored and starts messing around with poisonous berries. Maybe the true killers on this planet were the plants we ate along the way. Don't eat. In your mouth down to your stomach. <laughs> Let's be real, guys. Half of us ate the berries right here and ourselves to death before we got anywhere near the mountain. The other half of us died when this thing stung us. Yeah, you're not gonna be laughing when you turn into a mansquito in a couple hours. Maybe that doesn't happen. But what we do know it has is cooties. The strangest, most alien bacteria and viruses our buddies have never encountered before. Now Mills is bringing space aids home to his wife. This bonding montage is super sweet. It's like they forgot they're stranded a million miles from home on a planet overpopulated with bloodthirsty dinosaurs. After more random bull happens, Koa hears a distress sound in the distance and runs to the aid of a not quite a T-Rex baby stuck in a tar. She ignores Mills' commands to leave it, forcing him to help pull it out. Anyone bring the Dawn dish soap? No? I guess that little guy's just gonna come pre-seasoned for something else's lunch. <laughs> 
It's like DoorDash with more childhood trauma. As the trek gets real, Mill pauses to check on the bacterial infection, the little scoby growing in his shrapnel wound. When his pit boy loses the signal to the escape ship, he's forced to climb a giant redwood, even though it turns out he's only a few feet from a high vantage point cliff. Mills, your training probably involved some semblance of crash training. Tell me you are not going to choose the thinnest branch as your perch. God, that looked painful as f Thank God all those branches broke your fall on the way down. As Mills slams his dislocated shoulder into the tree again to try and pop it back in, Koa hears the growl of something lurking in the mist nearby. <laughs> And you're dead. Unless Koa's got some altered carbon level training stored away in her brain box from a previous life. She tries to use her baby arms to help pop his shoulder back into place, but it takes the full weight of her leg and his own force to slide it into position, grab his gun, and kill the first of these weird leopard dinos. Koa bursts through the forest and stumbles down onto a tidal beach. Meanwhile, Mills reveals he's been holding out on us this whole time. He's brought some sort of futuristic musket ball grenades. <laughs> Too bad he couldn't, I don't know, disperse them a little more and blow the limbs off multiple stampeding threats at once. Three grenades for every one leggy boy gives us bad odds no matter how many pellet grenades we brought with us. Now, I know you're asking, can things get any worse? Yes, things can always get worse. Koa hears clicking behind her and turns to find an entire flock of pterosaurs on the beach nearby. She quietly crawls out of sight, but soon the lanky crocs have found her. Since they know she She's the second main character. They wait to pounce just long enough for Mills to arrive and blast their faces off. How lucky. Koa goes to get down and... <laughs> a leggy boy drags Koa away, nearly to the rocky forest line, before he's scared away by shots from Mills' gun, which he fires up into the air instead of at the creature. Although I guess Koa's really too close and he might blow her head off. All right, shooting up into the air is fine. Mills finds her hiding nearby, but suddenly she won't come to him. You all right? <laughs> uh, he just saved your life several times. Am I missing something? He says they can wait, but hours later, she's still catatonic by the rock. Nightfall is coming, so he Jedi mind tricks her into forgiving him via the power of whistling. But seriously, can we go now? Knock her out and carry her if you have to. She thinks she hates dinos now while the sun is out. Just wait until she can't see in the dark. When night finally comes, they camp in a cave and Mills sets up a high-tech proximity fence thing, which he ignores moments later when his pit boy warns him of this space irregularity Koa saw earlier. Irregularity detected. Unable to identify irregularity at this time. Well, if they don't make it to the ship in time, at least they'll have front row tickets to the fireworks show. Later in the night, the proximity detectors go off. The danger's coming from inside the cave. Koa starts foaming at the mouth. No she didn't eat the berries. It's way worse. Just, just shoot me. Just shoot me. I draw the line at parasitic lamprey bugs that crawl in your mouth while you sleep. In the real world, he's rolling her over and finding a stump where her tongue used to be. He snaps off a perimeter sensor and somehow uses it as a lure to stab the bug and get it out of her mouth. But afterward, the perimeter sensors are still going off. He grabs his rifle as a growl rings out. The waterfall parts behind them, and the Black Noir version of a T-Rex charges, forcing them deeper into the cave. Well, this dino is definitely winning red light, green light. But also, all of this, all of it, the dinos going deeper into the cave is getting a big no for me. We've all seen the descent, and I'm not about to find out what the dinosaur version of it is. Even if there's nothing in there, caves are death traps, even with expert guidance. And Siri is no expert. It directs them down the cave where the wind is going, because I guess that means that's where an exit is. The problem is, we're a lot bigger than wind. Our best option here is to wait just inside the cave for the giant predator to leave before crawling back out and resuming the hike above ground in broad daylight. The choices just get dumber the deeper into the cave they go, so check off mind-altering gas fumes on your death bingo card. They reach what seems like a dead end, only to discover the pit boy led them into a corner of the cave with a narrow shaft leading to the outside. Too small for Mills to fit. Who could have seen this coming? So, he began 
begins digging with a shovel that looks like it came free with a packet of Mountain Explorer trading cards. Exhaustion, bits of rock in his eyes, and the strain on his torn shoulder wear him down faster than the rest of the trek combined. And when he stops, Koa demands he keep going to reach the family he lied to her about that's supposedly on top of the mountain. He tries to tell her the truth, but she can't understand him. When she won't give up, he remembers he's got a secret weapon, one that is absolutely going to get them buried alive under a pile of rubble. And they're dead. Maybe not from one pellet grenade, but they're not just using one. This time, they're doubling down on that stupidity by crawling into the narrow, unstable shaft with a second grenade in hand. <laughs> Who'd have thought grenading a cave would destabilize it? Caves are unstable by nature. They're caused by erosion, which is caused by things like tectonic shifts, root systems pushing into fissures, and water flow. During rainy seasons, water flows into the nooks and crannies, carving them deeper and deeper. And in winter, water freezes and expands, cracking those rocks apart. There's no predicting when a cave system will collapse. Today, engineers constantly monitor the cave systems that seem least likely to collapse so they they can still be safely explored, and people still die and get trapped in caves with insane regularity. There's also no need for any of this. Turn around, retrace your steps. You have a gun. If need be, taunt the giant T-Rex until it wedges its head into the cave mouth and shoot it in the head. Mills calls out for Koa and hears whistling from the outside. Apparently, she made it. So, he does the thing he should have done all along. He exits the way he entered. Yay, she made it. Now stay. Stay, Ko Koa. <laughs> Are you serious? As I've said before in literally every video about being lost in the woods, if you have no skills, no weapons, and no directional abilities, stay put. Let him, the guy with the weapon and tracking equipment, find you. Lie low, send out a whistle every few seconds, and prepare to dip back into the mouth of the cave at the first sign of danger. It's like you want to turn into a dino nugget. Back in the cave, Mills' flashlight stops working. This is why we avoid caves. No light? You die. No air. You die. Get stuck. You die. Hungry dinosaur with the supernatural ability to stay invisibly still like Drax. You die. <laughs> Again, what the f you have advanced interstellar technology, and somehow you can't figure out a reliable headlamp. Instead, you have this janky Walmart toy aisle garbage that dies on you in one night and doesn't even illuminate what you're looking at. But hey, it's different and futuristic. Lucky for you, I guess he needs to play with his food first. The dinosaur dips out of sight as Mills aims his weapon. He turns on his proximity detector and catches it sneaking up behind him. He reaches for his weapon when Freddy Krueger's ostrich leaps out and attacks him, knocking his gun aside. Only then does it attack, almost like it knows what a gun is. It bites down hard on his arm, an attack which under any other circumstance would absolutely be an arm snapper, if not straight up tear it off completely. <laughs> We get this, not gonna lie, pretty epic shot of a fight via hologram before Mills crawls over and turns on a jarring alarm, disorienting the dino long enough for him to shoot it in the neck. You see this? This right here is how they could have avoided almost every adversary on this 15 kilometer hike to salvation. This pit boy is the Swiss army knives of futuristic tech. Mills should have had his pit boy on at all times with its proximity detection function stretched to its distance limit. It can detect entities even in pitch darkness, so at all times, day or night, it should be running on silent mode, alerting us to imminent threats we can avoid or pick off before they even realize we're there. This single piece of underutilized tech should get them 80% of the way to the other ship without a single hiccup in sight. They probably even have time for a little pterosaur watching. Instead, they only turn it on when the set piece calls for it. This single function on this pit boy circumvents so many obstacles, it practically saves them all on its own. Outside, Koa finds a disembodied claw and poisons it with the red berries. A pretty clever strategy, which will never come up again for the rest of the movie. Somewhere nearby, Mills finally escapes the cave and sees the asteroid is on a collision course with Earth. 
What are the chances? Koa tries to hide from a Uteraptor. Mills hears her screams and runs so fast towards her that he can't avoid a pond of quicksand. Yet another quagmire that Pip-Boy could have saved him from, if he left it on. Koa is forced to trap the Uteraptor inside a rotten tree stump and waste the rest of their pellet grenades killing it. I hope you don't desperately need those sometime soon. I can't blame her for being trigger happy, but she just rang a very loud dinner bell. Mills screams for her as the quicksand finally takes him. A branch slams down into the muck. It's Koa. He crawls out and embraces her. Looks like he needs that hug way more than she does. He tells her about the imminent asteroid attack and they race for the mountain, ahead of giant beasts growling at them through the darkened forest. They come to a sheer rock wall and he sends Koa to secure a rope up top while he waits below. Behind him, the first impact from the meteor shower that will end the dinosaurs begins. They stumble into the ruined husk of the back half of the ship. As Mills runs system checks and confirms a rescue ship is prepared to intercept them in space, Koa starts to realize there's not gonna be a happy reunion with Mama and Papa. Probably! Probably! Maybe it's time to check the first aid kits for sedatives, Mills. The last thing either of you need right now is her running off or disappearing over a cliff. This is no time to go catatonic. He manages to dad up and de-escalate the personal stuff right about the time the proverbial hits the fan. Unfortunately, it's already too late. Too bad you couldn't have had that heart-to-heart -heart in space, watching the Earth get obliterated. Thanks to their high-tension plot armor, their fall from the cliff only results in superficial flesh wounds, an inoperable ship, and... glow from an actual meteor illuminates the nearby ground long enough for Miles to spot a rifle from 100 meters. He releases himself from the harness and dashes across open ground to grab it. This is why you don't integrate software into your guns. A second T-Rex appears. Unlike a certain other totally unrelated movie franchise out there, these dinosaurs don't rely on movement to see their prey. They surround Mills under a piece of debris and smash through it, just narrowly missing him. As they circle for a second strike, Koa releases herself from her harness. She uses the pit boy to play Mills' hologram of his daughter whistling. Turns out, laser pointers also work on reptiles. At least once. The Rex tosses the escape pod, accidentally correcting its orientation. As Mills empties the rest of his clip into the second Rex's body, the escape vessel begins a repair sequence, just in time for player three to enter the game. This is no Tyrannosaurus Rex. It walks on all fours. Its shoulder blades are pronounced and almost feline. And it has three claws on its hands. Whatever it is, it's mean and ugly, and it has mills in its sights. He tells Koa to launch the ship and runs off to lure it away. Great idea. If only she understood what she were saying. He leaps over a log, absolutely wrecking his up ahead, he sees geysers and limps quickly that way. The dinosaur follows. Mills bolts for a geyser and leaps over it just as it blows, hitting the dinosaur right in the face. But a moment later, it's staring Mills down, only partially blinded. Suddenly... Someone needs to get this girl to Olympic track and field training stat. She practically teleported here. The geyser erupts again, and the dino's flash steamed alive. Thank God there were geysers so close to both crash sites. I'd say they're resourceful, but I think they're just extremely lucky. If only we could all have the plot armor of a main character in a seven-figure sci-fi movie. The big event begins as Mills and Koa hobble aboard their jank busted escape vessel and blast off. <laughs> only to die horribly as a meteorite tears through their hole like it's made out of tissue paper. Just kidding, they make it. This is Hollywood, where our heroes never die. Or if they do, they don't stay that way for long. Jesus, there's so many reasons why you wouldn't survive this scenario. Everything from crashing on Earth, the one planet that can actually support life in our system, all the way to the dinosaurs reorienting their downed escape pod just so they can escape right before an asteroid obliterates the planet. But in the end, most of the dinosaur-shaped hiccups the 15 kilometers from point A to point B could have been avoided by simply using our super advanced futuristic tech better. For that reason, I think 65 was beat. Moral of the story, don't take a nap while flying a spaceship.